Last week in Submarine, Super B's refit has cost 200 million pounds and a lot of heartache. But after a 42-month refit, HMS Superb and a crew are back. The Super B is buzzing again. My target set up, new contact. Superb's first voyage was a surface sail of three days around the northern tip of Scotland. Now comes the sub's first real test, the dive. Everything for this nerve-wracking exercise has to be meticulously prepared. Superb has been in dock for three and a half years and nothing can be allowed to go wrong. Safety is paramount and any surface vessels within a range of 1,500 metres, nearly a mile, have to be contacted and warned. One two zero is a fishing vessel. Fishing vessel, morning dawn, morning dawn, morning dawn. This is surface submarine channel one six. Over. Oh. Uh, Robert, is that you over? Was that uh, young Smith I heard on the uh, on channel eight transmitting continuously as usual? Over. No, no, young Smith. You mean old Smith? You should see him all. The mood is relaxed, but there is an underlying tension. Commander Humphreys has years of experience in submarines. He has always wanted a career in the Navy, but there was something about the trade that drew him in. I joined the Navy because uh, I got a place at uh, university, because I passed the interview board, and because I was physically capable of doing the job. Went to university did my training time in general service and decided that in surface ships and as a young, impressionable, arrogant sod decided that I wasn't going to fit in in general service and started to look around for uh, something else, something more. Uh, you only get one shot at this life, so I thought I want to be in an elite. I have a mild form of hay fever, so I couldn't be a pilot. Anyway, silk scarves don't suit me. So submarines was my first choice. I joined submarines in 1979, so I've been doing it 20 years now, on and off. So it was an accident, really. But uh, the thing that attracted me from the start <coughs> was actually, I thought, for me, for my character, uh, I had the best chance of achieving command, which in, in my branch is what it's all about. It's the only job worth doing at sea, as far as I'm concerned. The trade is all about taking submarines beneath the surface and that diving is about stations, to happen. Diving stations. And depending on who you talk to, this is the nerve centre. This is where the ship is controlled from in terms of its course, depth and speed. Um, this is where we fight the ship from, this is where we navigate the ship from. But for other people within the ship's company, there are different control centres. Back aft, um, in the manoeuvring room, as we, as we call it, the engineers sit goggle-eyed, watching their gauges, controlling the uh, reactor and the secondary systems, because actually we're steam-driven. So everybody has their station. This is the control room, yeah. It's, it is the nerve centre. It's where the brain lives. That's me, by the way. Block captain, secure radar. A sharp brain, under pressure, and sometimes a sense of humour. But what else do you need to command a submarine? You need to have a sort of confidence. And part of the reason it's worked for me is because I did an apprenticeship in the first eight years, whereby I did all the jobs that the young executive officers of my branch do. I did the casing officer, the, the accounts, the classified books, uh, the watch leading, the navigating, uh, the, the sub-specialisation in, in the warfare disciplines. So by the time I'd done the eight years, um, I was ready to do the command course, the perisher. I sort of changed, if you like, metamorphosized, maybe a bit grand, but that's where I suddenly discovered that, yes, I could do it. So then, apart from the arrogance and the fundamental ability, which is no great shakes, so I actually got the last thing in place, which is confidence. And that's what the course gives you. And then it's just experience. And I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> Ulster watch, Captain. <coughs> I have the submarine. Clear the bridge, come below, shut and clip the upper lid. It does take confidence and experience to dive a 4,200-tonne boat beneath the surface. 
Not all the crew has been on a dive before, but ship controller for today is coxswain Paul Kennel from Gosport. Experienced as he is, there is some worry. I don't think it's uh, nervousness as such, it's just uh, a little bit of apprehension probably on hoping that the dockyard have done all the jobs and tested all the valves correctly and everything's in the right place. Ship control really is, is a thankless task of, of just getting all the checkoffs done within a time scale while the captain's at your back saying, come on, I want to dive in 10 minutes and you've, you've got to get on and just get through your checkoffs, basically. You, you're quite busy, you don't have time to worry about what might happen. On deck, crafty search ship control. Right on board, you ready? Ready, sir. Make a pipe diving now. Pipe diving now. Diving now, diving now. Open three and four main vents. Open three and four main HMS Superb has been inside the dockyard for three and a half years. Today, the 125 officers and men will rely on the expertise of dockyard workers they've never met. The aim will be to let the bow come up as far as it, as it can before we open one and two main vents. Simply expressed, that expertise has to be trusted to make sure that Superb systems work. If they do break, the crew could be in serious trouble. The boat could be underwater, unable to surface. Let me know as soon as the bubble is steady. It's not just a case of getting the angle of the dive right. Also vital is, literally, keeping an even keel. The bubble is like a glorified spirit level, which, with no access to the horizon, is used to correct any imbalance. All the vents are now open to the sea, and Super B begins her first descent. It's a time when everyone on board wonders what could happen if things go wrong. Well, um, this is the pointed end of the submarine, um, the foreign escape platform. This is where uh, the ship's office is, over in the corner. Um, and this is where we're supposed to escape from in the, in the event of uh, an accident, uh, sinking or uh, any sort of problem like that. Uh, the escape tower is over on the left there. Uh, it's a one-man escape tower, so only one person can, can escape at any one time. And we're then supposed to fleet around this area and into the tower and escape through the tower. And the, the tower's supposed to fill up with water, equals the pressure, equalises with the pressure outside of the submarine, and then the lid opens, the tower lid opens, and we go up. Uh, don't, and whether that works, I'm not going to try and test that one. So, um, but this is where we would escape from if, if we needed to escape. No one wants to do it for real, but training is everything. It's in the case of such an emergency that submarine crews are put through the deep escape tank at HMS Dolphin in Gosport. All submariners have to go through it. Every four and a half years, we go to Dolphin to do the um, submarine escape tank requalification. That's the 100 foot tank, it's a 30 metre tank that we have to train in every four and a half years. And they build your confidence up to say that this is how you would escape. But whether you would, I, I, I don't know. It's not a thing any of us would wish to do. Another of Superb's crew, Petty Officer Doc McGonagall, went through his emergency training at Gosport and he got the bends, a potentially lethal condition. I've only done it in the water once. Um, and I, for, what, for some reason, the, the, nobody's quite sure. I suffered um, from the bends when I did the tank and spend, I had to spend um, eight hours in a recompression chamber on com um, compressed oxygen and stuff. It was a nightmare then time in hospital, so they don't, let, they don't allow me to do it anymore. I just have to go and splash around in the swimming pool instead of going in the water. So we've got a doctor that works on a submarine who's seasick, he's got the bend. Yeah. Do you like the sight of blood? Yeah. I don't mind that, actually. Yeah, that's not too bad. You get used to that. The other things, I can, do the, I can deal with that, but the seasickness, and that's a bit different. On her way down, for the first time, it's up periscope. The captain's eyes when the submarine is stalking its prey. He's not happy with his lenses. Can we clean the periscope windows before we dive? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Check. Clean. What are we cleaning with? Brillo pen? The dive is what makes the submarine so radically different to any other warship. The bow's not coming down as fast as it ought. 
uh, put some water into, uh, into the boat and trim it for us. It defies all the laws that govern surface ships, or skimmers, in submarine parlance. Level bubble, 10.4 metres. Shut, 3 and 4 main vents. It purposely sets out to sink itself by replacing air in its tanks with seawater. It's not the speedy process you see in films. It can take 10 minutes to dive. On this first dive for the crew, it's going to be a long 10 minutes. Slowly, gently, superb slides beneath the surface. Six down, 30 metres, back to 17 and a half. Six down, 30 metres, back to 17 and a half trimming. Six down. Stop trimming. We have control of the bubble, Plangeman. We have control of the bubble, sir. Six, Six down, down on achieved. the boat. 14 and a half metres. Submarine passing 16 metres, report all hatches from forward. It's a first tentative dip beneath the surface, just down to 30 metres and then back up again to periscope depth. Nothing too strenuous, but despite the massive 200 million pound refit, she is a middle-aged lady of the sea. At 25 years old, she has to be treated with care and respect, or she might bite back, and nobody on board wants that. The next system seems to be uh, passing some sort of uh, water. Paul Kennel runs quickly through the checklist. All seems nominal. The old girl has passed her first test. Even a drip of water where it shouldn't be is dismissed. What we thought was a leak through there is no longer a leak. And the boat is in fact tight, number one. A tight, dry boat. It's all that could be hoped for. Reggie Perrin admits now there's relief. We might not have shown it, but there was, because you've just been in dry dock for three years and everything's been put back together again. Now, is it going to leak? Especially under pressure. It's not nice. Every single creak that comes up, what was that? Commander Humphreys is going to rely on information below the surface from Reggie's station in the sonar room. Ops controller. New passive contact on a bearing of 210. Cut. When the submarine's dived, us and here do become the eyes and ears of the submarine. If you can imagine you're listening to an orchestra, that is what we're doing at the front here. We're, we're listening to a whole orchestra here, which is what your ears are listening to. Now, if you can appreciate, the ear can't hear everything. So we've got special equipment in here, which is tuned to different frequencies to listen to things that the ear can't hear. So, um, that's why I mentioned the orchestra. If you've got the whole orchestra playing, that's what we listen to at the front, which is a whole lot of noise coming in, and we separate that into little bits. And then, if we want to listen to one particular part of that orchestra, say um, the flute section, I have other sonar equipment within this sound room who will listen to just the flute section of that orchestra. At the moment, we're listening to the whole picture now. We're listening mainly to, there's, there's one just went off then, seismic explosions. Is what that is, that's a, a survey vessel is out surveying the ocean bed. The operator now is just trained onto a, a fishing vessel, which if you listen carefully, you can hear the beat of the propeller going around and the actual noise of the diesel engine. Now if I wanted to, I could separate that engine noise from the propeller noise and work out what speed that engine's doing whether it's a two-stroke or four-stroke engine, and also how many pistons it's got. And when it comes to hunting for another submarine, that's a whole different ball game. That's when we've got to bring in our other sonar systems we've got in here to look for that particular one noise in the water amongst all the whole noise altogether. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack when you're looking for a submarine. But we have the capability, as they say. Reggie has a whole ocean to listen to. But the one person he can't listen to is his wife, Gail, and find out her problems. On a submarine, there is absolutely no way that we can contact our family to find out if anything is wrong, which is always on the back of your mind, especially when you come back in again, you, it's always dreading, it's the back of your mind, if you get called up to the captain's cabin, what is it about? And it could be bad news. Derriford Hospital in Plymouth. Gail is visiting for another appointment. Cancer runs in her family. It claimed the life of her grandmother and mother. She has to be closely monitored. It's a situation she has to bear alone, without Reggie's support when he's at sea. 
69 classified. One shaft, four blades. 269 RPM. 269 RPM. Reggie knows about the visit, but there's little he can do. She doesn't like going up there, I know, but she has to go. That's the time when I'd like to be with her. Would you like to come and lie up on the couch? Leave your bag on the chair there, first of all. Second new contact, I'm bearing on 245. Cut. Michael Perrin, at nearly two, has to become the man of the house. Submariner's children grow up fast. No new contacts gained during the alteration. Found one clearing the barracks. Oh, sorry. I had to have a scan, and then also I had to have an internal scan just to check that everything was okay with my ovaries. And also, I have to have a blood test, but I didn't have to have that done today. And what happens is that happens once a year, just to check that everything's all right. And they just told me that everything's fine for another year. Over 500 miles away, Below the waters of Loch Goyle, Super B is also looking for a clean bill of health. She has proved she can dive, but she is designed for stealth, and that means she has to run silent and run deep. The next test is known as being on the wires. Superb will spend days running up her systems and trying to stay invisible to a shore-based listening station. This is where the stealth element of a hunter-killer comes into play. I can see you, but you can't see me. At the end of this period, Superb will be capable of silent running. Now the crew has got to get used to living on her. And whether it's days, weeks or months, how do submariners cope with close confinement? People say to me, how could you possibly be cooped up in that black tube for so long? The answer is, none of us are, are special. We just do things the right way, and it works. The submarine's crew is split up according to specialisation, and about just over a third work back aft. They are marine engineers. They, of course, live for it. We don't consign them to, the, to some horrible build to live, much as I'd like to in some cases. They keep the nuclear plant and the secondary propulsion systems going. They deal with defects and all the rest of it. Howie Kelly is a nuclear engineer dealing with the reactor. We've just come through uh, 58 Bulkhead, the uh, forward airlock. So there's a forward airlock. That's brought us into the tunnel where we are now. Uh, and this is basically the passageway that connects forward and aft on the submarine. Uh, below us is the, uh, the RC, or the reactor compartment, where the reactor's housed, and the steam generators. Uh, that's an unmanned compartment uh, at sea. Uh, and then through the bulkhead uh, aft of us, through another airlock, that's the engine room, and all the electrical generation and diesel, and where uh, the steam that's generated in the RC goes through to drive the engines and generate electricity. How much is generated is frankly awesome. We generate enough power with the nuclear plants to support the electrical load of a small town. There are only 125 of us, but we exist, we live. We have a laundry, we have a, uh, a canteen, we all eat very well. Um, we uh, work, play and rest in the same space, so we have the domestic arrangements uh, and our work environment all on hand. So yes, we are our microcosm, if you like. Uh, let's switch to a fish analogy. If you look at this as a barracuda, we're half teeth and half engine. The boat is laid out so that the uh, after half is nuclear plant and steam propulsion. A lot of power pushing us along. Uh, and the front end, where we live, work, and most importantly, to a warship, fight. It's time to find out if this barracuda has real teeth. Load two chew. Load two chew. This is a spearfish, the latest weapon in a submarine's armory. They cost a lot, but you get a lot in return. The torpedo can strike a target well over the horizon. Although its speed remains classified, it's generally thought it can travel faster than the legal limit on any British road. Five, four, three, two, one. 
That's the target, and that's the weapon. At the high cost of each fish, it's prudent to test with dummies. Classify submarine target. That is bang in the middle of TUA. Intercept Alpha, that's the first hit. In his own inimitable style, Commander Humphreys confirms their successful run. Hit confirmed. Large pool of black smoke. Bodies diving in the water. Shark circling. Ship control speaking. HMS Superb has just launched her first spearfish weapon. The run was successful. That is all. Hurrah. Superb can dive, run silent and fight, but to what standards? It's no good doing all those things badly enough to endanger the boat and its crew. This is where Captain Submarine Sea and Shore Training enters the fray, the Sea Riders. When a submarine has been built or refitted or goes to sea for the first time after a long period alongside, then sea training staff, submarine sea training staff, go to sea with that submarine to help the captain train up his crew to deal with emergencies that might uh, confront them at sea, fires or floods and so forth. Trials that the submarine has done up until now have been limited to uh, shallow water. Uh, um, the next phase of her trials is to take her into deep water. So over the next five days, we will be giving the submarine uh, a series of single evolutions, simulating them by uh, smoke for fires and releasing air for HP air bursts and some propulsion failures as well. And we'll be checking that they can uh, cope with those uh, emergencies and keep their submarines safe. Five days, 120 hours of intense pressure. There is a lot at stake, not least the reputation of Commander Humphreys and his crew. At the end of uh, five days, uh, the CSS team, team will uh, clear the submarine uh, to go into deep water to finish its trials. It's a pass or fail criteria. If they fail, then we just continue training and they'll, they'll not be given clearance to continue. Hydraulic burst, hydraulic burst, hydraulic burst on the after escape platform. In next week's submarine, the Sea Riders test the crew and then test again. There's problems at home, but no one has time to dwell on those. The examination will be something the crew will never forget, and it could turn out to be a nightmare.